welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Creative Piecemeal Podcast. This is Tammy, and today I am joined with cellist Johannes Moser. Hailed by Gramophone Magazine as one of the finest among the astonishing gallery of young virtuoso cellists, German-Canadian cellist Johannes Moser has performed with the world's leading orchestras, such as the Berliner Philharmoniker, New York Philharmonic, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Chicago Symphony, BBC Philharmonic at the Proms, London Symphony, and more. He's a dedicated chamber musician and currently holds a professorship at the prestigious Cologne Hochschule for Music und Tanz. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to have you on this show. Um, I follow you on Instagram and it's always very interesting to watch your practicing and and the way the way your mind works with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always torn because, of course, with with the open practice sessions that I do, um, I offer a really an unrestricted view behind the scenes. And often, you know, as as a musician, you wonder, well, do you do you really want to tell all, show all, or do you want to keep a sort of air of mystery? But then I felt, especially during the pandemic, that it was hard to well obviously it was hard to perform but it was also hard to to connect with with people uh, because everything we were all zoomed out and i felt well why don't i take it to the next step here and and just open up my practice room and 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 that's been resonating quite well with people it seems and i i do those live so there is there is no makeup there is no uh, you know retouching there is there is no editing it's just what it is and I uh, I can tell you that I'm very focused during these sessions, <laughs> as you can imagine. So that's also added a benefit for myself. But I, I do enjoy sharing that online for sure. Yes, I think it's really neat. It's a wonderful way to really be transparent about the struggles and the triumphs in terms of practicing everything from the little stuff, but also even the physiology of playing and practicing and you know how you sit and and where you put the bow on the on the string and great for not only younger players but also for people who are more experienced and thinking okay how can i up my game yeah there is that element uh for sure i think um people can distill from it what they what they like you know and uh i've had some some good feedback actually you know people send me messages and ask, well, I saw this on your practicing session. Uh, why do you do that? And then, you know, if someone comes back with, with an interesting question, of course, I'm more than happy to answer it. Uh, that's the, I guess that's the great benefit of social media. It's that, that it's not a one-way street, but actually you, you know, you communicate on sort of a level playing field if you want, uh, if you wish. And, and uh, that's, that's very nice for me because of course that in a time when, when it's hard to go out, uh, it's, it adds a sort of personal uh, touch to the whole thing. And it's not just, you know, you're not just broadcasting into the unknown nothingness of the internet, but uh, it seems that, that it reaches people. So that's good. And you recently performed in London. Would you like to tell, tell us a little bit more about that? Well, you know, the London proms, of course, are an institution that, that is legendary. And before such a performance, usually you schedule trial performances uh you know with other orchestras and 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 in, in other cities and you build up to the event and in this case of course there was no building up because there is no season going on at the moment so the last concert i had played was like seven weeks ago and to get from the point of let's say zero to one thousand in one second was was just really um quite tough to build up to and when I say tough, I, I really mean tough in the sense that, uh, as 
as a performer, one needs to go through that whole buildup of um, adrenaline and, uh, you know, to, to raise the temperature, the performance temperature to a certain level. And if you do that after your summer vacation and you can hold that temperature throughout the season, then you're sort of floating on that, you know, level of excitement and on just a level of adrenaline. And you don't always need to build up to each performance, but you're sort of floating from one to the next. And if you have to, you know, go from cold turkey to just, you know, tearing your heart out in front of 3,000 people uh, and also half a million people or a million people, I don't know, like live on the BBC radio, that's a big gig. And so I, it, it, it took me a while to, to get to terms with th that that's what I will have to do. And there again, social media helped me a little bit because I found that I've, you know, I got a forum where I could actually practice beforehand openly. I, I could perform small bits openly and sort of already get myself used to the idea that I'm performing for people and not just in my practice room. And so, so yeah. And in the end, I mean, it was quite very exciting to be there. It was great to be in front of a public again. The proms public is very special because the proms obviously is, you know, for connoisseurs, but also for people who don't usually go to a concert. And so that adds another element of, of excitement that hopefully you can take both the people that know about classical music and also the people that do not know so much about classical music on that journey with you. And uh, now I think it worked, for, it worked quite well. Yeah, and I'm sure not only is it just a special honor to play for the prompts, but also I'm sure it was emotional after you know, the kind of years that creative artists have had lately. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and the orchestra felt the same. I mean, last year there was no prompts and now there was a prompts again. So that was uh, for sure, for sure an emotional aspect as well. And, Everybody, you know, has, has had different experience in the last 18 months. And so to sort of generalize or to, or to say, you know, who, who, takes, who takes the prize for the biggest suffering, <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's been just so individual. But when you come together at a concert as a collective, then suddenly you have all these individual stories uh, come together at that moment and um, manifest themselves in the exchange of music and to have such a unifying experience is amazing and to have it not just with soccer which we recently had here but to have it with music is great uh, so yeah I, I was very happy to be there it's a beautiful thing for sure to be able to make music and and you've been playing since you were eight years old I was wondering you know who or what inspired you to become a musician and why did you pick the cello the cello I picked because I needed to get away from the violin. So it was my escape route. My parents are both musicians and I'm now fifth generation in our family of musicians. So it was kind of, you know, family, uh, family business, if you want. But with music, I mean, everybody has to make that decision themselves and really think hard about that decision if you want to dedicate your life to music and if that is something that you want to pursue. Because even in years without pandemics, it's it's bloody hard. <laughs> it's really, it's really extremely challenging, and the travel is is very hard. The the uh, hours are you know not necessarily socially friendly. And you never know when inspiration strikes and when you actually feel that you want to work, and then you need to disappoint other people because you've made made other plans. It's yeah, it's it's not the easiest uh, job, and it's certainly not a nine to five. And um, so when I saw my, my parents uh, live that life of, of musicians, I, I got a pretty good idea what it means uh, to be a musician because they, they were doing different things. My mother, she was a soprano and, uh, you know, she was a traveling artist, a soloist. My dad played in an orchestra. And so I got to see these two different aspects of musicianship and what it means and how it can be lived in a in a good way and at first I wanted to become an orchestra musician like my father and then I I got lucky at the 2002 Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow and that sort of changed around the plans a little bit and 
suddenly I found myself confronted with this prize and what to do with it. And it was really, if, if that prize did anything, it, it started a thinking process of what to do with my life other than, you know, get a good position. And uh, it was a very adventurous time. And, you know, to decide to become a musician is one thing, but that's like saying, well, I'm, I'm just going to study, study law. But that doesn't mean that, you're, that you know what you're going to do later on. Like you can become a lawyer, you can become a judge, you can go into social work, you can work for McKinsey, you can, you can do so many different things. And I think when you decide to become a musician, you need to keep that openness is that, yes, you want to learn everything you can about music, but what you're going to do with it later in life remains to be seen. And I have a lot of friends that studied music that actually did end up working for McKinsey uh, because it's, uh, you know, being a musician is a, you need a very structured approach to working and to problem solving. And that's exactly what they need uh, in these consulting firms. So, yeah, making that decision to, to, become, to become a musician also asks for openness and creativity now more than ever, because now we have, we have less and less opportunity for, for fixed jobs that you, you know, that you hold between the age of 25 and 70 until retirement. But I think as musicians, you need to, be, you need to have the openness to be versatile and to apply your your craft to wherever is possible. And, and that's what I've been trying to do. And also in being able to adapt to the changing times and like you're involved in social media and that's a way to get, get music across and connect with fans and listeners and, or even people are doing online lessons now and, and being able to share the love of music and teaching music to people all around the world in different ways, which is always nice. For sure. Yeah. If you didn't do music, what other creative art do you think you would pursue? I was always interested in performing arts. So I think the theater or film business would have had me for sure. My mother, as I said earlier, she's a soprano and my aunt is a soprano as well. And they were both working in the opera world. So I was exposed to the stage very early on and, and to staging what that actually means and and I was always very attracted by that and I thought that's a great yeah just a great thing to pursue and uh there's this magic moment that someone in Greece discovered 3,500 years ago is that when you put someone on stage and someone off stage listening that there is a sort of exchange and magnetism going on between the two and I guess it dates you know far far earlier by just people sitting around a fire and, and telling stories to each other and, and and singing and you know dancing around the fire and to this day that's why i love theater to this day i am so excited when i'm sitting in the audience and i i witness that moment of performance because i feel it holds a lot of magic and it holds a lot of mystery and that mystery doesn't need to be explained it just needs to be experienced and to also find myself on the other end of the spectrum actually being the performer that sends out energy into the into the public i love being on both ends both the receiving and both the giving end of that spectrum and uh, to this day i i i i love that art form of you know be it theater be it ballet be it music be it opera that combines all of those those art forms it's it's a mystery, but it's fascinating. Very true, very true. You've performed a lot of pieces in a lot of places. Is there like a dream setup of a concert you would want, like a certain venue with certain pieces that you've always wanted to program? Well, I, I'm lucky in a sense that all my bucket list items have sort of been been fulfilled. You know, like I, I played with the Berlin Philharmonic, which was sort of my dream orchestra growing up. Um, I played all the big cello concertos and now I have the luxury to commission pieces by myself. I think if, if I were to say what I, what I like doing most at the moment is that juxtaposition of playing the classics like Dvorak, Elgar, Schumann, Haydn, Lalo, and also bringing new pieces to life. And uh, right now I'm in the process of 
um, creating a project for electric cello and eight speakers. And uh, I have pieces written for that. And it's an octophonic setup. So it's a surround experience that you're going to have as a listener. And this is new, new ground to be broken. And nobody's been doing that before on sort of, you know, the classical music uh, playing with with a with a cello and uh, you know bringing it to to concert venues and I I find that incredibly exciting that I'm dabbling in something that hasn't been done to death if you know what I mean and on the other hand I play the Dvorak concerto which you know every cellist has in their repertoire and doing sort of unknown things and and doing new things inform very much what I do in Dvorak. And Schumann and Elgar, and they, yeah, they, they keep all these pieces fresh, and that's why these pieces never get old, you know, because I I have enough other projects to counter sort of the you know the feeling of normalcy, shall we say, and and then every piece of music suddenly is exceptional, and and that is a is a dream come true, I would say. What's it like, you know, going back and forth from your beautiful Granary cello to and this modern electric? I mean, is it almost like having to put on different shoes? Yeah, they are, they are two different instruments that can be played with cello technique, but they are different instruments. So I don't even consider them both in, in the sort of the same arena. Uh, but I'm, I'm lucky that through my cello technique, I can actually play that electric cello because the electric cello really is, is only interesting in conjunction with a computer and with effects. And the sound of itself is, is not so appealing. And so where, whereas I do all my colors and, and all my, you know, differentiation on the normal cello with, with my bow in my, my left hand um, and with the weight of my body uh, with the electric cello, you do all of that with, electric uh, effects and so that's a completely different way of thinking how to shape sound and how to create a mood and the problem is of course that nowadays we have so many tools available for for an electric instrument that suddenly that ubiquity of possibilities uh, seems almost stifling and so in a way in order to stay creative you need to limit yourself to just what you really need and you need to have a very clear vision and that sort of clarity of vision is also something that i that i love for my more standard pieces because it means that i i sharpen my tools and i sharpen my awareness for for what i actually want to apply everyone's creative process you know is different and honed over the years how do you approach one of the standard cello repertoire first of all i i burn my music, my sheet music every two years of the classics. And I, through that, I feel like I, you know, I, I get a fresh part. I can have fresh ideas. I can, I can use fresh fingerings and I don't fall in love with our old ideas, which, you know, is something that, that can happen easily is that you, you become your own museum or you become your own cover band, if you know what I mean? And I want to, I want to stay away from that. And, um, yeah, it's a it's it's a process that I that I impose on myself because I I just want to keep my my pieces fresh. And then what I what I try to do is I isolate myself from recordings, so I'm not listening to anyone else while I'm in the process of working or learning or reworking a piece. But I really try to stick to the music as if it was a new piece of music, and I try to get in contact with the composer as good as I can. Now, of course, when you know someone like Dvorak uh, who unfortunately passed away 100 years ago. I don't have his phone number, but um, what, I, what we do have is a manuscript. And that handwriting tells you a lot about the emotion that goes into the piece and, and how it's crafted. And the manuscript of the Dvorak Concerto is one of the most exciting things to read because you can see the process that he's been going through and the struggle that he's been going through. So that's a good way for me to approach the composer and, and to get close to, yeah, as, as close as I can to, to what they have left. And in Elgar's case, for example, there are two recordings of the piece that nobody listens to. Everybody listens to Jacqueline Dupre. And there are two recordings with Elgar conducting with Beatrice Harrison at the cello. Phenomenal playing, 
And I mean, I would give so much to hear how Dvorak was conducting his concerto or how Beethoven wanted to have his cello and piano sonatas played. And here we have an example of a composer conducting his own piece. And um, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that source. Yeah. And then of course, after you've compiled all those sources and you've, you've compiled all that material and, and informed yourself in the best possible way, then you have to make it your own and you know, transform all that knowledge that you've um, compiled into something that works for you. For example, if I read a accent or a sforzato or a mezzo forte or a piano in the score, I'm not only playing an accent, but I'm trying to think, well, what does that accent mean to me personally? Yeah. And how, how does that speak to me what I read? And I think it's that process of transformation of um, taking all the information and making it yours is what really leads to interpretation that leads to the pieces really fitting like a glove, you know, and then, then you, you fit those pieces to your needs. And, and that's a wonderful process. And that's a lifelong process, actually. I mean, the pieces like Dvorak and Elgar, I've played them for, for decades. And uh, still, I discover new things. And both pieces are just some of my absolute favorites. Pretty much anything written for the cello, I love. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. You, you guys get the best repertoire, seriously. We get good repertoire, and, and we're lucky in the sense that we had protagonists over the centuries that inspired composers to give us their best material. Because, of course, if, you, if you're a composer and you have, let's say, within a month, you have five great ideas. Well, how do you divide those ideas, right? I mean, do you give the best ideas to the violin or to the cello or to the clarinet or to a symphony or to a chamber piece? And I guess each piece asks for, for different things, but Schumann once said that each idea comes with its inherent form. And I love that idea. That's why in the Schumann concerto, you have so many different formats coexisting at the same time. In the beginning, it sounds like, you know, just a great aria. And then uh, in the exposition, it sounds very, sounds very chamber music-y. And then in the second movement, it sounds song-like. And then the tutti uh, going, you know, from, from the first movement exposition to, uh, to, to the second part uh, sounds very symphonic. So he, he goes through all these different formats within a concerto. And I love that idea that, that different ideas bring their own form and sort of, you know, don't, can't just be applied with, without their shell, so to speak. That is certainly wonderful to think about. It sounds like you do a lot of deep thinking when it comes to composers and pieces. I think I do. I think I do. And it comes also with my second job, which is uh, being a teacher, being a professor at the Hochschule für Musik und Tanz in Cologne. If you want to learn something, you need to teach it, right? So that's, that was a nice, nice thing to discover that that's actually true. Through working with students and through them experiencing pieces for the first time you always get a fresh view on repertoire that you thought you know and so you of course you bring to the table what what you've studied and what you believe to be true but then to hear it through through the ears and eyes and 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 also through the hands of someone else is is a very interesting process and i mean i i try to to read a lot i should read more but i certainly read more than my students and <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish they did more reading. Uh, I think it's, it's vital and, and it should be just an inherent interest. You know, there's so many, so many people have had great thoughts about music and uh, great inspiration all around. And, and if we can tap into that, that knowledge and also that emotional knowledge that has been recorded over the centuries through good writing, then, you know, that's, that's a fantastic thing and, and should not be left wayside as some secondary thing. You know, um, most of my students, they believe that, you know, practicing is, is the only thing and it's important, but it's, it's certainly not the only way to approach music, I find. Agreed. What are some books that you find recommending that you recommend a lot to students? So I'm a big fan of Nicolaus Hanoncourt, 
uh, he was a writer in, well, a, a cellist, first of all, and then he became a conductor and he's a musicologist and he's a great inspiring figure. And then he became a writer. Uh, he was one of the first people that uh, brought back Baroque performance practice. And he connects in the most interesting way and most, most beautiful way, music and language and how music has a certain grammar and a certain meaning that mostly can be, of course, understood of the people of the time because it's their music and so it's their grammar. But as people that, you know, we, we approach the music 100, 200, 300 years later, after it's been written, we need to get in touch with the grammar rather than just the notes. Because if you just learn the notes, then you just learn syllables and numbers. And to actually form those syllables to words and to sentences and to poetry. I think that, you know, you need to know the grammar. So, so that's where, where he comes in. I also like uh, the unanswered question from Leonard Bernstein, uh, his book. Um, of course, he alludes to the uh, piece by Charles Ives, an unanswered question, where he also connects language and music, which is great. Right now, I've been reading some essays by Susan Sontag. It's a very interesting essay on, called Against Interpretation, where she vehemently speaks against art just be trying to be understood and categorized rather than seeing art as it is and not trying to apply the filter of interpretation uh, which sort of you know stands between you and the artwork and I think that is as it, it, very interesting for me because obviously I my my job is interpretation yeah so how much do I actually bring into a piece from myself and how much do I just let the music speak and I think that's that cannot be quantified it just needs to be an ever ever changing and ever re-evaluated process um, between you and the artwork but i do think that if you always approach uh, music or art or uh, like you know painting or, or books with the question well what did the author want want to say or what, what did the author have in mind then you sort of distance yourself from the artwork because you're not just confronting yourself with what's written, but you want to sort of transform what is written into sort of a higher meaning or, or distill the meaning out of it. And I feel that that sort of, you know, puts a distance between you and the artwork. And I, so, I mean, I, I really enjoy her writing. It's very, uh, she's incredibly smart and incredibly intellectual. Sometimes I need to read a passage three times to actually grasp what she means, but, you know, that's, that's me being slow. And so I, I love the challenge of reading her. I'll definitely have to look that up. It sounds so interesting. You know, the idea, um, of course, you know, it's so important to appreciate the work of art for what it is. Very interesting for sure. I was wondering, how has your life in the creative arts been different than you imagined? Well, I think that the pursuit of any kind of art, whether it be music or writing or photography or painting, is so much more than than just itself. I mean, the, the process of creating artworks is, is wonderful, but also it gives you a sharper image of life. And and that's what I that's what I love about the pursuit of music, especially. You get a whole new relationship to the sound world around you. And uh, like John Cage said, there is there is no silence. Uh, you know, when when you quiet down, you just hear more of your inner self or you hear more of what is going on around you. And yeah, to, to have that heightened awareness of your surrounding, I think it's a wonderful thing that, that at least comes with music. And I guess if you, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit into photography. So, so after a day of photography, like I, I look at the world differently and I'm not a very good writer, but, but if, I, if I do have to write something, then, then suddenly I have much more appreciation for, for words and then for what language can do and what language can transform and and how 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 much much more rich our language actually is than what we use on a day to day basis and uh, well you know I I use English but my German my my language is of course German and, and uh, I that's where I feel at home and and where I you know I can I can play with the language and and I I love that. 
It's wonderful that you pursue other creative arts as a hobby and, and as another passion to really enrich your life. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I mean, very early on, I, it was clear to me that creativity inspires creativity. So if, if I feel uncreative at the cello, but I, I need to get going, then, you know, going out, out with my camera, like, you know, gets that gets those creative synapses going, and then I can take that to the instrument as well. So what's a common myth or stereotype about being a musician that you hope to break with your work as both a performer and a, and a professor? I think the myth is that probably that that we're married to music and I don't know I think life is just so much more rich than just limiting yourself to one thing so I'd, I'd rather be married to life I, I don't know it's 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 hard to say I, th that's a stereotype that I encounter a lot is that you know musicians just live in the practice room and, and all that and I don't know I think there is there is a time for music and then there is also a time when to turn off music and and, and just do something else and I think that's important. And that's, that's also what I, what I tell my students is like, be really focused on your music, but then look around and don't, don't shut out life, you know, which, which I feel like a lot of youngsters also do. They, they're like, oh, yeah, I stopped with soccer and I stopped with reading and I stopped with uh, working out and I stopped with swimming because now I'm only going to do music. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's the beginning of the end. Like, and that, that is also not how we are nowadays anymore, right? Like as, as a musician, like you also need your, to be your own PR firm with, with social media. And as a musician, you need to be your own advocate and you need to be an educator. You need to go into schools and, and, and work with youngsters and you need to be a teacher. And it's just so many different things, so many different hats that you have to wear that if you limit yourself early on with just being in the practice room, you're not going to acquire the skill set that is required of you as a musician. Very true. Very true. It's so important to be well-rounded and cultured and experienced life because then you can bring those experiences back to the music because I mean, the composers obviously lived fulfilled lives, you know, they didn't necessarily shut themselves in a room and do music 24 yeah. seven. Right. Yeah. One final question before we go in your own words, what does it mean to live a creative life? That's a big question for me personally. It means when I feel creative or when I feel like I'm, I'm doing something creative, I feel the most alive. And it means that I'm tapping into an energy that is bigger than the sum of its parts. And so no matter what creative avenue I open up, if I'm able to tap into creativity, that sort of mysterious energy field, then then I feel alive and then I, then I feel that ideas come to me. I don't even need to look for them, but somehow they, they manifest themselves. And to be creative, if, if it doesn't come to you naturally, then what I like to do is just put two completely foreign ideas, two completely foreign objects, two completely foreign approaches next to each other and try to make something of it. And marrying these, these two elements uh, will bring forth a third product and, and you've created something and and that is sort of a good exercise if you know if some if people find themselves sort of you know stuck with creativity and yeah creative life is is maybe life itself yeah i i feel like if i'm creative then i i don't feel any layer in between myself and life anymore yeah but but it's 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 in i'm in direct contact and that's a good feeling <laughs> and something that I, that I don't want to ever give up in, anymore in my life. Agreed. Agreed. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and listeners, you can catch Johannes Moser online and checking out his live practice sessions, as well as wonderful already recorded concerts and upcoming concerts. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for a creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.